Thank you so much for the warm and very kind welcome. I don't know if, if double alum is a word or term, but uh, we, we graduated from two of the same uh, institutions. So I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Thank you so much for inviting me um, here. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Policy Power and Progress. Um, and I'll explain that a little more uh, in a moment. As Latanya mentioned, I'm here representing the Urban League of the state of Arkansas. I've recently come on board uh, at the end of 2018 to the organization. I'll talk to you a little more about the history of the Urban League nationally and in Arkansas as a part of today's lecture. Uh, but I'm really just excited to be here on this last day of Black History Month. Um, I know that, I know as you all know, that uh, black history is certainly a part of American history. And so while we commemorate it this month, um, we know that it is a history that is really just interweaved uh, into the history of our state uh, and our nation. So I hope today that the discussion can um, add a little more to that interesting history, maybe some things you may have not known about uh, the Urban League. Um, and then I really want to make the connection between that history and why that matters today, hence the, the title. Um, so kind of a historical look based on the uh, Urban League um, really at um, how, do we make, um, how do we make progress and how is that connected uh, to um, policy and power. I am going to grab this clicker here. And then we'll just jump right in. And so I also want to save some time if you all have questions. Um, so I'll try to go through the content um, pretty quickly um, so that you all can also ask some questions. So first, let's start with a little bit of history of the National um, Urban League. So the National Urban League, um, well, let me ask, um, who in the room is familiar with the National Urban League? Okay, so that, that's a pretty standard response. I either meet people who know everything that there is to know about the Urban League, or people who say the name sounds familiar, I'm not really sure, definitely in Arkansas, and that's because we haven't had a presence in Arkansas for a very long time. So I did not grow up in Arkansas with an Urban League in existence. And so most of the people who know about the history, um, well, I'll take that back. Since I was old enough to become a member of the Urban League, uh, that there was not an Urban League present here. And so most of the people who um, are aware of the presence of the Urban League, they talk about how impactful the organization has been historically in the state. Um, so again, excited to be here and tell you about what we're actually doing today. Um, so the National Urban League is a historic civil rights organization dedicated to economic empowerment in order to elevate the standard of living in historically underserved urban communities. And historically, that certainly has been a focus on African-American uh, communities. Uh, the National Urban League was founded in New York City, uh, and that was in 1910. And there are two people that are uh, attributed with uh, founding or co-founding the organization. Uh, and that's Ruth Standish Baldwin and Dr. George Edwin Haynes, among others. Um, so the organization um, really um, rose out of um, what is known as the Great Migration. Um, and so some of the historical kind of things that were happening in our country at the time, one of those big things being uh, the 1896 Supreme Court decision, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, where the Supreme Court essentially upheld or said uh, segregation uh, is legal in the state. And so as a result of that, we saw conditions uh, for certainly a large number of African Americans, especially in the South, uh, it was really tough. Um, we saw uh, basically this, this sort of codified that it was legal to discriminate against certain people. And so what, what was already, I would say, a tumultuous time uh, and a major fight for equitable access to uh, sort of basic resources became even more difficult under, uh, after this decision was made and so as a result, we saw the Great Migration. A lot of African-American families moved from the South to the North in search of equity, in search of jobs. 
in search of the opportunity to uh, make a decent living and raise their families. Um, and so that history is directly related to one of the founders uh, of the Urban League, who I want to come back to for a moment, Dr. George Edmund Haynes. He was an Arkansan. He was actually born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and he relocated to New York City with his family, again, as a part of that great migration in search of economic opportunity and a better, a better life for his family. Not only was he an Arkansan and one of the people attributed with starting the Urban League, but there were also lots of other firsts. He was the first executive director of the National Urban League. And by the way, the National Urban League, that name was adopted in 1920. Uh, and so since 1920, the organization's been known as the National Urban League. But he was the first executive director. Um, he was also uh, a scholar. Uh, he attended Fisk University. He also earned a master's degree at Yale. And he was the very first African American to earn a doctorate degree from Columbia University, which he completed in sociology. And so again, um, it's often a, a lost history. Uh, the, the growth and expansion and even the idea and formation of the National Urban League, one of the most prominent civil rights organizations in the country, um, has its roots in Arkansas. And Arkansan was involved in starting that organization. A few other um, leaders in the history of the Urban League, or one other I'll mention that you may be familiar with, um, is Whitney M. Young, Jr. Uh, and so he is one of the most recognizable um, leaders of the National um, Urban League. And under his leadership, which started in about 1960, 61, uh, and lasted for 10 years, so he was <laughs> through the 60s and the 70s, um, Whitney M. Young led the Urban League. Um, that's really when the organization began to emerge as one of the strongest voices and forces uh, in the American civil rights uh, movement. He also began to bridge that gap uh, between the organization being out in the community and kind of offering direct services and support to working within government uh, to actually begin to change policy and to highlight issues such as the inequitable investment in the creation of jobs in the African-American community. Whitney M. Young actually served um, as advisor to three, three U.S. presidents, uh, and he was often criticized for his techniques. Uh, so you think about the context, uh, what was going on in the world during that civil rights era in that period, the distrust uh, amongst different groups of people. And here was this man uh, representing the National Urban League saying, well, let's, let's work together. Um, you know, let's, let's work with the government, same government, again, who um, upheld uh, a lot of these laws that led to some of this inequity. Let's work with the government and let's try to create some job opportunities for the least fortunate. And so he was often criticized um, for his methods, um, but lots of folks also knew him and considered him to be a major power broker because he was able to use his power and influence um, to make a significant difference. I'm um, really in the history of our, of our nation so the Urban League um, has five major pillars. Um, it was four, I think until last year, they officially added a fifth, but the five major um, pillars that the organization works on uh, and seeks to um, empower individuals and communities are in education and youth development, jobs and employment, housing and health care, and the one that has always been a part of the Urban League but was formally adopted is justice. Today, the Urban League um, has expanded. Uh, the reach is very broad. There is the national organization, and then there are local affiliates throughout the nation. Urban League of Arkansas is an affiliate of the national office. Each of those affiliates do operate independently, and so they're able to cater to the specific needs uh, of their community and the people in that community and their members. Uh, but today the National Urban League has 90 affiliates in 37 states in the District of Columbia and provides direct services to more than 2 million people nationwide. 
And one of the ways that the National Urban League or Urban League affiliates are distinct from some other um, civil rights organizations um, is the historical commitment to actually providing direct services. Um, and so in addition to doing advocacy work, trying to influence policy, the organization actively provides direct services, tries to connect people with job opportunities, provides training um, and access to financial literacy training and access to home ownership opportunities. Um, some urban leagues um, operate early childhood centers. And so that's one of the distinguishing characteristics of the organization. And, and certainly the reason why I think the um, Urban League has been a major voice in civil rights and justice movements for so long um, in our country. Uh, the Urban League, uh, from its founding, um, has always been uh, interracial. Um, Dr. Um, George Haynes, he was an African-American man and scholar. Um, Ruth Standish Baldwin, the other co-founder, uh, was a white woman who was a philanthropist in New York City. Um, and so that's also one of the themes you will see in the history of the Urban League, which then takes me to the history of the Urban League of the state of Arkansas. So very similar to um, the effort to launch the national organization, um, the predecessor to what's now Urban League of Arkansas, the Urban League of Greater Little Rock was launched in 1937 by an interracial group uh, of citizens uh, who got together, met in 1937, um, just to say, we, we wanna do something, we wanna make a difference. And they gathered uh, and began the process of launching what was then the Urban League of Greater Little Rock. Uh, the Urban League of Greater Little Rock went through a few name changes, um, did attempt to expand services beyond um, just Little Rock, but historically mostly stayed centralized in the work that was happening in the community that was served. And by the way, um, most urban leagues throughout the country, um, they, they operate in that way, that way as well. Most are city-based, and so you'll see the Urban League of St. Louis, which is a fantastic affiliate. Uh, they're all great, but that's one of the longer standing larger ones. Uh, we are actually one, one of a few um, statewide uh, Urban League affiliates uh, in the country. But for over 50 years, um, the Urban League existed in central Arkansas and provided um, services and was really intimately involved in a lot of the major civil rights issues and movements that were occurring um, locally as well. One of those that I, I would highlight um, is the desegregation crisis at Little Rock Central High. Uh, many people at the time uh, were reluctant to take the unpopular stance um, against separate but equal uh, policies in education, um, but the Urban League took that stance. And because of that, they lost funders. Uh, you know, it's oftentimes not that folks don't agree with you but sometimes they're afraid to agree with you publicly, especially when you are taking a stance against uh, status quo. And so that's what happened uh, here in Arkansas. Uh, they stood up in support uh, of those children being able to get equal access uh, to a quality education and nearly had to close their doors uh, because funders pulled out uh, and no longer wanted to support the Urban League. Um, so again, after 50 years, the organization um, did eventually have to close its doors. The ups and downs of the nonprofit sector funding began to um, dwindle, but we are now back. Um, so in 2015, fall of 2015, uh, we opened our doors um, again, again, launching a statewide effort. Uh, we are headquartered in Little Rock um, at the Willie Hinton Neighborhood Center. And we have satellite offices in Springdale and in West Helena. Uh, we are continuing to grow every single day, um, but certainly still in the stages of being a new and emerging nonprofit. Um, and so we invite you to continue uh, to support our growth. You can become a member of the Urban League um, and, excuse me, um, and be an active part of continuing to build uh, the impact of the organization. We rely very heavily on our members and our volunteers. In fact, later today, uh, we're having another event with our young professionals um, who, who are very visible in the, uh, in the Urban League movement and we'll be doing uh, a bit of a mini training to kick off um, our series on um, advocacy.
So just to kind of bring uh, things to a close on the history of the organization, um, as you can see, there really has been um, a very rich history of involvement uh, in social justice issues, uh, in equity, uh, and in policy. So I'm going to transition a bit then to talking about why that's relevant today and how, that, uh, how those intersections and why they're, they're important uh, policy power and making progress. And I really want to start with some definitions so that we all are kind of starting from the same place uh, as I move forward in the lecture. So first I want to talk about um, policy um, and why policy is important. And when I say policy, I'm, I'm referring um, to public policy in the large sense, but it can also be organizational policies in a, small, um, in a, in a, in a smaller way. Um, so policy is important because it's historically significant. So you think about the history that we just talked about, uh, some of the laws that were passed, um, some of the decisions that were made, how that history and those historical policies fueled an entire movement. I also think it's important to understand the history so that we know um, what, what have we tried already, uh, what worked well, what didn't, and are there certain things in history that we want to make sure that we don't repeat. So policy is important because of the historical significance. Um, policy can um, also have intentional or unintentional impact disproportionately on a particular group, which is directly tied to issues of equity. And so I'll explain um, what that means. Sometimes it could be in subtle ways. So for example, maybe you live in a neighborhood um, where there's some unfavorable development that happened in your community. Um, so you see this a lot of times uh, related to environmental issues. Maybe you're in the community where uh, a factory uh, decided to, uh, to, to build and, and work and organize. Um, and so that's kind of, well, actually in some, some ways that probably might be intentional policy um, because people who don't have a powerful enough voice to say no ended up with that unfavorable development in their community versus another community. But that's sort of an example of how policy issues sometimes, um, we see this a lot in education policy. Um, sometimes some of the decisions that are made, while it might not be intentional that it will affect a particular geographic region uh, or community, um, we often see those sorts of things um, happen. And so again, important to note that it's important to think about who various policy decisions will impact and how that ties in with issues of equity. A policy is also important because it codifies system changes. And so if you want to see progress in a permanent way, it's important um, that there is some supporting policy to make that um, happen. And so I have, a, I have a history of working at the state legislature. I'm a lobbied on behalf of children and families. And I worked in state government, um, worked, did policy work in state government. And what we would often see happen um, in, in state government and certainly in state legislature, we would see these um, kind of smaller commitments uh, we'll do two years of funding this, or we'll pilot this for a couple of years. It's really great intervention program. Um, but then no one ever comes back to say, this worked really well. Like, let's make this an actual policy. Let's make this a law. And so that effort that we saw work really well for a couple of years no longer continues. We've seen a lot of that um, with, with healthcare system changes. Um, our state for several years um, made a lot of investments in piloting a lot of community-based programs around access to mental health, but there was never a policy decision made to make those permanent pots of funding. And so all of that improved, all of those, the progress um, went away when the funding went away. And so um, that codifying of those system changes is not always a bad thing. Um, so, sure, when we talk about the Civil Rights Movement, think about things like Jim Crow laws. Those are scenarios where some of those policies were not good. They had a disproportionately negative impact on certain populations. But then there are other laws and changes, things that overturned a lot of those laws. You want those things to be 
to be a part of, um, of the, the law and legal structure. Um, so again, I've highlighted just a couple of examples um, here, core segregation laws. Um, also, government redlining practices. Does everyone know a little bit about what redlining is? So they get the map out and outline or literally redline certain communities that were you know, sort of hazardous communities, and that directly affected lending practices uh, for home ownership. And so in those communities, which happened to be typically minority communities um, or communities where there were low-income families, uh, in those communities, uh, lenders didn't want to lend to those families to purchase homes. And we still see the effects uh, of some of those practices or policies um, today in home ownership and, um, and, and historically, if you go to a lot of the communities that were negatively impacted by redlining, if you go to those communities today, those are often the communities with high rates of crime, uh, poor housing stock, poor housing quality um, today. And then finally, one I wanna share, um, because this is a, a Arkansas specific policy um, and how these things can affect access to sort of our basic needs. Um, it's uh, access, it's related to access to tuberculosis treatment in the state of Arkansas. Um, so until 1967, um, Arkansas had segregated uh, facilities for the treatment of tuberculosis, which was a major health issue during that time period. Uh, they built a facility in Saline County in 1931, um, and it was more than two decades, though, after the whites-only facility was initially opened in Logan County. So 20 years later, a facility was built uh, to treat African Americans. There were also funding differences uh, <coughs> based on policies passed at the state legislature and how to actually fund those facilities. Even though the facility that was built kind of 20 years later uh, to serve African Americans uh, in Arkansas who were dealing with uh, this disorder, it opened with 500 beds. Um, but without the necessary funding um, to, to fund those beds, there ended up only being 26 beds at this facility, um, a 600 person waiting list, which was about 14 years long. So again, maybe that wasn't a major law um, necessarily, but it was a policy decision based on how we were going to fund those facilities, um, and it had a direct impact on a particular group. So I want to look a little bit at this public policy cycle here. So how is public policy made? So an agenda is set, someone has to decide what are we going to address, what's going to be on the agenda. Then policies are formulated related to moving forward that particular agenda. Policy is adopted, implemented, and then oftentimes it should be, sometimes it's not, evaluated to determine if that policy actually addressed the particular issue we wanted to address, and then it's sort of this cycle. So if it didn't, we're back to the agenda setting again, and then the cycle continues. Um, and so while this is the public policy cycle that I'm holding up here, um, you could see the same thing in a workplace. Um, so maybe your organization has decided that they're going to implement particular policies around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so someone has to set that agenda. Um, then you have to actually formulate what that policy change is going to be. And so maybe you decide you're going to ensure that a certain portion of contractors that you do, do business with or uh, minority and uh, women and minority owned businesses. So first, that has to be a priority for somebody in the company in, in some decision-making capacity. Then there has to be a policy proposed and put on the table to actually then adopt that policy. Then it has to be successfully implemented. Then someone has to go back and actually track some data and information to say, did we actually meet those goals? And if you didn't, then let's reevaluate the policy. And so these things seem like really simple uh, policies and things to change, but when you start to see the cycle in each of the, we can see that these you know, policies where they can fail at each stage of the cycle. Someone may think it's important, someone might even propose a policy, but then when it's time to adopt that policy, if you haven't convinced the right folks, they'll go, eh, yeah, maybe we come back to this. Maybe this is a low priority. 
or maybe it is implemented, but how is it implemented? Is it Im implemented with sufficient resources for it to be effective? And so, again, you can see how policy can have an influence on a major level or just at an organizational level. So I also want to talk a little bit about power. So we're talking about the intersections between policy, power, and progress. So a few definitions here in discussion about power structures. So a power structure is an overall system of influence and relationships between individuals within a selected group. So how, how are those power dynamics, how do those relationships play out within that group? Um, power or authority is distributed between people uh, within that group. It's about how that power authority is distributed between people within that group. And that can be, again, I talked about the example, it could be at an organizational level, but it oftentimes refers to in, at government, uh, at an institution, in a broader um, society. So power structures can be formal or informal sets of rules. So formal, of course, is an actual often written policy at an organizational level, a law. Uh, but there also could be informal power structures and dynamics that are set up. And so in certain scenarios, you just know who's in charge. You know who's making the decision, whether that is a formal power structure or a formal policy where someone or some group has been designated um, or not. Um, also, Power structures can be constructed in a way that maximizes certain values like fairness um, and efficiency. Conversely, they can be constructed, constructed in a way that uh, push sort of these ranked systems of hierarchy. And again, you can look at some of the historical issues um, in our country around race uh, and equity. You see this in other nations. You can look at things like caste systems. Uh, and so again, a lot of those systems are very formal, but some of them are just informal. Um, you know, there, there is just a sort of built-in knowing of what the ranking order is among a group of people. Um, power structures are fluid. So power structures can and do change. Um, that is sort of a consistent theme about power. It often changes, but it can change very rapidly or it can be a very slow process of change. Uh, power structures can evolve over time, or power structures can change in a very revolutionary way. Uh, and power can change in a peaceful way, or it can change violently. So let's go back to our little then diagram uh, and look at now our cycle of public, public policy combined with sort of the influences of power. And so you can see at each stage in this process of changing policy, there are various uh, areas where power matters in the agenda setting, uh, in the actual policy formation. So who is in the room and has a seat at the table to bring forth um, ideas and suggestions on what policies we should be formulating to address certain issues. Uh, policy adoption, who's making those decisions? We're currently in a legislative session. Our state legislature is often making those decisions. Who, what's the demographic makeup of the state legislature? Are certain groups of people um, more represented than others? Are people with certain values? Are people with sort, certain um, political affiliations? Those things matter um, in, in terms of, um, excuse me, policy um, adoption. Um, sometimes it happens at a very minimal letter, le level. Um, so like within an organization, maybe it's an organization where it is a very um, top sort of heavy and your CEO is making those decisions or is it an organization where power is shared? Who's making the decisions? Sometimes when we're thinking about state laws, um, Often if people vote on them and it's a ballot issue. Um, so it's not the state legislature who's making the decision, it's the people. Um, but power matters here. Policy implementation power matters. So one group of people can make the decision to, uh, to adopt the policy. It might be a completely different group that decides on how the policy is actually implemented. So those power dynamics are at play there as well. And then is it evaluated? Who decides if the policy you adopted was uh, effective. 
who decides if the goals were accomplished. Some people might say, I wanted all 10 goals to be accomplished, and someone else will say, eh, minimal progress is okay. And then I have the two, I intentionally have the, the two arrows coming in on the agenda setting piece of it because there are all of these internal and external forces that are always at play, even setting the agenda and deciding what issues are actually important. And so I hope that this begins to um, depict how policy is inextricably tied to power. So I want to kind of bring the conversation full circle here. So we talked a lot about policy, why it's important, um, power structures, how those things interact. Um, people, I added people, because people are a huge part of this, um, this, this cycle. Um, you have to have people at each stage and phase of this um, process. And so whether it is people who are proposing various policies, whether it is people who are exercising power in various ways, this equation is really how you see progress made when those different pieces come together. Um, and this is my quote at the bottom. I was trying to find a really good quote to sum it all up and I said, I'll just make up my own. Uh, we must equip and empower people with the will, the hope, and the tools to make progress. And I think all of those things are important um, because oftentimes you can have a group of people who have the will, they want to see change, but maybe they don't have the tools. Or oftentimes you have a group of people who have the will, but maybe they really don't, they give up after a while, they don't have the hope. Uh, because maybe they've been at it for a while. And so I think folks need all of those things um, in order to make real progress. And it's very intentional in saying empower. Uh, I think that language is really important because uh, it's not about forcing ideas of what progress looks like onto folks. Uh, and it's not about telling them uh, what they should be doing, but it's really empowering individuals, empowering communities to really understand um, how to use that cycle and, and, and where they fit in, um, what the issues are, actually defining what the needs are in their communities uh, and, and making those things um, happen. So I'd imagine that the founders of the National Urban League recognized this. Um, I think that they probably understood how policy and power interact and intersect and drives movements uh, and groups of people. I think that that is probably why our tagline is empowering communities and changing lives uh, because that's the goal of the Urban League and a number of other organizations that are committed to working on social justice issues, who are committed to achieving equity. Uh, it's really helping to empower those communities uh, to, to reach the solutions uh, that work for them. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments or, or thoughts, I hope that I've provoked some further uh, discussion today. I'd be happy to, to hear your, your feedback or answer your questions.